I'd want to welcome everyone to our fourth seminar uh, webinar in our North Dakota Reclamation series. Um, we're going to have a few housekeeping items to take care of, and Mike's got our slides up, so he's going to hopefully uh, move it along as I go, and then we'll turn it over to him. Um, my name is Natalie West. I'm a research ecologist uh, with the Pest Management Research Unit in Sydney, Montana. I work on weeds and classical biological control of weeds and range and wildland systems. And I'm looking forward today um, for our speakers, Mike Rowich and Brady Allred, um, and to talk about using technology to enhance reclamation. So um, a few kind of housekeeping reminders. Uh, we do encourage you, please, to put your um, name and where you're from in the chat. Make sure it's visible to panelists and all attendees we, so we all kind of know who's in the community. Um, I want to remind you that all webinars are recorded and will be posted um, at ndreclamation.com. So if you miss something and uh, you want to go back, the information is there. We do encourage you to use the, to use the chat to discuss any ideas that you have. However, please do use the Q&A um, to ask a question to our presenters and you can have it answered live. Um, we will have kind of questions at the end of the seminars just to remind you um, that that's how we do it. Each of the speakers will speak and then we'll moderate the questions at the end. So get your question in there and um, either live or uh, by text we'll uh, be answering them. So. Uh, and also just a reminder that our next webinar will be next Wednesday. That'll be our final webinar on um, March 31st, and it will be Reclamation to Achieve the Most Bang for Your Buck. So please do join us then. Um, so Mike, if you can switch the slide. Um, just as a reminder, North uh, NDSU has, is a non-discrimination uh, institution and um, the, the uh, Rules are there so for you to read and, and see. Um, and then, so the last slide. Uh, I just want to then introduce, just to keep us moving, our, our speakers. Our first speaker is Mike Rowich um, from Rumble. And he is a geologist and geographer specializing in the implementation of geospatial technologies to optimize environmental problem solving. And with this company, his focus is on remotely sensed data analysis, collection, and visualization applied to environmental monitoring. So Mike's team specializes in aerial imagery and image analysis to understand site conditions, reduce uncertainty, and help efficiently characterize and monitor environmental sites. So I'll turn it over to Mike then. Uh, and remember, put your, put your questions in the Q&A and your chats in the chat box. Thanks, Natalie. Thank you for having me here today. Uh, as you introduced, I'm Mike Rowich. I'm an innovation project manager at Ramble. And I'm excited to be here today to talk about how uh, drone imagery data, artificial intelligence, satellite imagery, and some of these other advanced technologies can be used to uh, promote um, innovation and reclamation monitoring. So as, as part of my work, I spend a lot of time talking with reclamation managers, and there's a number of uh, universal pain points that there just exist in reclamation monitoring. And this is sort of where we try to aim our technology to provide value on our projects. So making sure we're not just doing something cool, but also doing something really useful is key to all of this. So oftentimes, you know, monitoring, uh, monitoring reclamation projects is expensive and resource heavy. It requires a boots on the ground approach. Um, and it's very difficult to track changes over long time periods that reclamation projects often take. It's between years to decades on many of these projects. It can also be tough to make really objective decisions. And um, also sometimes it's hard to proactively uh, make decisions about where to improve and, and spot opportunities for improvements. So out of understanding these sort of universal pain points, this is where my team comes from. Uh, we wanted to build a technology to improve uh, some of these processes. And with my background, I'm trained as a, as a geologist and a geographer, wanted to find the best image mapping technology and utilize some new, new technologies becoming more available like AI and machine learning. And I like to say that we're trying to turn ecologists into superheroes, giving the 
um, regular colleges the ability to do more than they've ever done before, um, reduce the amount of cost it takes to do a certain task, reduce the amount of time, and improve decision making over over um, over the work. So Ramble, which is the company that owns us, is an international consultancy. Uh, they operate in 34 countries with more than 16,000 employees, and that's allowed us to grow quickly. Uh, you'll see some of the examples here today from, from around the world. Uh, over the past two years since we started this program, we worked on five different continents. So it's a pretty exciting uh, place to be working at. So generally, we go through this three-step process, and you'll see this in our different examples here today. But first, we select an image resource. This can be drone imagery, which you'll see in some of the examples today, or it could be satellite imagery, aerial imagery, or even we're investigating currently the use of stratospheric balloons for capturing imagery data. Then we can analyze that imagery, obtain a baseline survey of metrics like vegetative cover, the aerial distribution of uh, invasive species, or some of the other examples you'll see today. And we can go back and monitor that year after year and show uh, document progress across many of these sites. Because all this information is digital as well, we can automate some of the reporting that has to take place. And so um, sometimes it just takes a long time to write a PDF report. We can take what used to take weeks or even months and compound that to just a few days to get some of the basic information described to our clients. So this is all great, um, but let's zoom in and actually look at a few tangible examples of how this all works. Uh, we'll start with this uh, mining client. This is actually in central Queensland in Australia. Uh, they have an aluminum tailings facility where they're monitoring vegetation dieback around the tailings uh, facility. So in this case, there's some leachate that might be impacting the surrounding vegetation. And they're having to, they're regulated to actually look at this change over time and assess uh, the environmental impacts from the mining facility as well as trying to understand what the environmental impacts are from droughts. The big challenge here is that this facility is more than 160 square kilometers. So the approach we took is a spectral approach. Um, and a little bit of basic physics here. We have the electromagnetic spectrum and with the naked eye, you can see what uh, the wavelengths that you basically see on the screen here, but there's a number of other wavelengths which are beyond what you can see with the naked eye, and they provide specific insights into things like vegetation management. So the graph that we see here on the y-axis is a measurement of reflectance. So that's the percentage of light that's reflected back off of an object. So if it reflects back 100% green, that object will probably look very green. On the x-axis, you can see a representation of the wavelength of the electromagnetic spectrum in nanometers. So for a typical healthy plant, this is what a spectral curve would look like. So at different wavelengths, it will reflect back different percentages here. You can see for a healthy plant, the green bands reflects back uh, pretty, pretty high relative to the red bands or the blue bands. And you also see that in the near infrared, this area just beyond where the red is here, is also relatively high. In contrast, a stress plant might exhibit a curve that looks similar to this. And so what you see here is the green is actually a little bit lower, um, but so is the near infrared. So there's a little bit of information that we can glean here in the near infrared and in other wavelengths that you may not get uh, just by looking at a plant or taking a picture with, with the naked eye. And so what we do is we use satellite-based measurements that take discrete measurements at these wavelength intervals and then we could calculate indices based off of, of that and make deductions about how um, the plan is actually performing in terms of its, its health. So for the site in Australia, the key question was, how do we tease apart uh, droughts? And so what we did is we used freely available satellite imagery that's um, from the European Space Agency called Sentinel-2. Sentinel-2 orbits around the site uh, more than once a week. And we were able to get 62 images that were cloud free over a period of about three years from 2017 to 2020. We looked at these images and we actually took those bands and calculated a, uh, an indices called the natural difference vegetation index. So this is using band combination of uh, the red, 
and the near infrared and green to kind of calculate um, what vegetation health is. And so what we see here on the y-axis is NDVI values and the higher that value, the healthier we can expect that plant to be, the lower the value, the least health we can expect. You see four curves on here. And what we did is we actually looked at four separate areas. We had two potentially, uh, or three potentially impacted areas. That's the green curve, the blue curve, and the yellow curve. And then we had a reference area, which had a similar soil type, similar vegetation characteristics, similar hydrology uh, precipitation regime here. And one of the key findings that we had was very simple by just observing this, this curve that um, there was a drought that happens in 2019. We can see all of these areas dipping sort of in unison. What this helped to do was actually provide an important line of evidence for our client and trying to understand, you know, are all of these impacts that we're seeing related to the mining facility or are some of them related to droughts? And we're beginning, uh, this is an ongoing project, we're beginning to be able to tease this apart. The nice thing here is that when we met with our teaming partner, the ecologist that's actually on site in Australia, uh, this was the feedback they gave us. They said, this is a really useful graph. We've actually been, been guessing. We just have a hypothesis. And until now, we didn't really have any evidence to support that. So this gives us that big picture looking at 160 square kilometers. And we're beginning to sort of understand how uh, drought is impacting versus mining impacting here. So ongoing work that, uh, that we hope to continue delivering on moving forward. For this next project, we'll move to a different continent and a different uh, technology sensor here. Um, this is working for a client in, in England called Highways England. They essentially manage the uh, interstate system in England and they're responsible for managing the soft estate adjacent to the roadway. So about 30,000 hectares, similar to maybe what a DOT in the United States would do. So the problem they have here is they have a unique species uh, called giant hogweed. And if you're unfamiliar with giant hogweed, it was first introduced as an ornamental plant. Now it's gotten out into the wild and it's actually known as the UK's most dangerous plant. Uh, this is in other parts of the world, such as in, in the uh, Pacific Northwest and New York State. And it can cause painful burns, even permanent scarring when the uh, plant releases a sap and that sap, sap uh, comes into contact with sunlight and moisture, it can cause a very severe burn. So hopefully this, um, this little boy can get out of the way here. Um, it wasn't harmed, but this shows you kind of the scale of the plant as well. So working for Highways England, they had this 350 acre area. They were looking to have us test technology on. It's a remote access here um, with only a few uncorrect trails you can kind of see running throughout the, the site. And what we did is we, we used the drone to fly over the site and captured more than a thousand images of the entire area. We then stitched that imagery together into a cohesive map of the entire area that was very high resolution and had a pixel size of less than one inch per pixel. So we took all this information together and what you can actually see here is that the drone imagery is, um, is high enough resolution you can actually detect some of the giant hogweed. That's these brown patchy areas you see. So the next thing we did is we actually took a uh, an algorithm and train the algorithm to identify the unique signature. So it looked for both the shape and the color of giant hogweed. And we're able to map the aerial extent of giant hogweed with a high degree of accuracy. The benefits here is that the drone flies over the whole site in just a few hours, keeps the ecologist out of way. Um, it's very fast. And you know, in terms of the image analysis, we had an ecologist look at this for several hours and try and point out where in the imagery at least, where they could find areas that the algorithm missed and they, they couldn't find any. That's not to say we may not have missed some of the areas um, underneath the canopy cover, but this provides us a really fast and accurate first glimpse at where the giant hogweed populations are. Not only that, but we're hoping that uh, this can be a part of a five-year remediation program to actually go ahead and eradicate these species and prove that we're eradicating those over time. You know, the drone gives you the advantage, similar to how you can cover 160 square kilometers, where you can see this white box on the bottom of the screen. Um, you can see there's individual plants that are sort of popping through and they may not be visible from the road. So this type of mapping using drone imagery and AI gives you the ability to quickly look over large areas, hundreds to thousands of acres, and 
come up with an estimate of what the aerial extent of a given species population might be. So this is where I say, you know, oh wait, there's more. Um, it's exciting because there's other species that you could do this with. And we're still kind of pushing the envelope about how many species we can actually detect this with. It's highly dependent on this, this species, uh, seasonality and the extents, the actual physical extents of those plants as well as some of the phenology. Um, but as you see an example here, many of you from out west will recognize this red grass as cheap grass. And we've developed a prototype for identifying cheap grass at one of our mining plants in New Mexico. Um, we also have been able to identify Phragmites for some of our clients up in New York State. So, you know, it's exciting. There's a lot of different, um, different opportunities to expand this on, a, on sort of a case-by-case -case basis at the moment. So the last kind of thing I'll, I'll present here is uh, one of our ongoing development projects with well pad reclamation, where we're using uh, drone technology to actually improve this process. Right now, we're working with Dr. Michael Curran. Um, some of you may know him. He's in a number of societies. Recently graduated from the University of Wyoming with his PhD, where he worked on spatially balanced design and optimizing uh, field collection processes. So Dr. Curran's process that we're building off of so far has been to use sample point. Um, this is a, a method photographic technique where just like the person on the screen here, you walk out, take a picture, and then you can take that picture back to the office and select uh, pixels and classify those pixels as belonging to bare grounds, earth, much the same way you do with a line point intercept. The difference here is that um, by collecting, one of the bigger differences by collecting this digital photograph, you can actually then take that back into the office and it's about seven to 10 times faster walking around taking these photos in the field. You can do the same thing with a drone, and it's actually 25 times faster than a line point intercept method. And you collect many more data points than you would um, with a line point intercept method. Traditionally on well pads, um, you know, you would have just one transect maybe on the well pad in the reclamation area and one pad, one adjacent to the well pad in a reference area. What we're able to do here is using Dr. Grand's spatially balanced approach. You randomly select one point, and then there's an algorithm that automatically distributes the rest of the points across the site. He's taken a step further by optimizing the actual path you would take using what's called the traveling salesman algorithm. So when you randomly assign that first point and then it develops the spatially distributed points, uh, the image on the left here shows what the order of those points are. We can actually make it so that it's the most efficient path possible here. Um, this may be intuitive when you're walking, but the real benefit is of being able to program the drone to walk for you and capture this data. So this is a screenshot taken from one of Dr. Curran's papers where we're actually looking at uh, flying the drone automatically around this well pad, capturing both the reference area as well as the area in, in the reclamation area, and then performing a sample point analysis on that. The big leap uh, that we're trying to take now moving the, you know, beyond this is to actually automate another part of this process. So we're taking this raw imagery, which you would normally bring into sample point and manually classify. And we're looking at, instead of just random points in this image, we're actually gonna measure what's happening across the entire image using artificial intelligence. So this is, this is a tremendous increase in accuracy because instead of trying to take a small representative sample, you're actually measuring the entire image and you're able to assign an accuracy and a measurement to that. Typically what you see is a trade-off at um, scale versus accuracy. Uh, the smaller the scale, you can actually zoom in and look at things, the less you're able to get that overall picture. And using artificial intelligence, we can analyze every pixel and every single image, and there's no more trade-off in scale. You can look at this very fine scale, and you can do that across the entire site. So this is sort of what that um, first prototype begins to look like, where you have images on the left that are actually predictions of the image on the right. And so you can see there's this uh, purple flowering plant in the center here, and we're able to predict you know, what's the aerial extent of that? What's the aerial extent of bare ground versus some of these different shrub types out here? So very early stage, but we're hoping to continue developing this 
uh, further into the summer. So if you have well pads that you're trying to reclaim and you'd like to, uh, to perhaps consider this method or test this method, we're actively looking for those partners now to, to do this. So some of the conclusions from the work that we've done so far is that uh, using these, these digital and automated uh, results, you can still, um, you can reduce some of the bias that may be subjective. Uh, you know, if you send a couple of, of people out in a pickup truck to spend the summer um, monitoring well pads, some of them are going to take, uh, you know, better notes than others. And so this helps make sort of a uniform, uniform reporting results. Um, you have one kid, you know, one person with a high school degree and one person with a PhD in ecology, they may record things very differently. And in fact, we found in the literature that two people with PhDs may record line point intercepts in different ways, even though they're doing it uh, just right after each other. As we've also shown, this has the potential to significantly reduce the amount of time uh, spent in the field and, and for a given site. And so you can now cover more sites than you ever could before in a given time period. This is important when we're talking about the phenology of specific plant species. Of course, very important to all this is the fact that uh, we can help reduce the amount of time you spend, let's say on a given well pad or a given area on a site. And that allows you to answer bigger questions than you ever could before. The digital record aspect of this is also really important because we can take that data, go back to the office and analyze it. And if that data is scrutinized, you can then have somebody else replicate that analysis. Um, and actually scrutinize this in a very defensible manner. These type of analysis are also very repeatable and they're designed to go back year after year and show change, uh, whether that be improvements or degradations. And the digital aspect also allows us to automate some of the reporting, which is very exciting. What we see in the future is some opportunities for data-driven optimization of seed mixes. And so what we mean there is that by identifying um, let's say in well pad reclamation, we can fly 500 well pads, analyze that data, identify what species were present and compare that to the seed mix, and then decide, well, you know, this, this particular species was only present on one well pad. Maybe you shouldn't be spending money on that in the seed mix. And overall, we're hoping that, uh, that we can help bring all this together to make every ecologist, like I said at the beginning of this, and to a super ecologist, give people the power to make um, more informed decisions and to address bigger problems than they ever could before uh, with the same amount of resources. So with that, um, I don't want to take up too much time because I know Dr. Allred has some very interesting content himself. And so I'm, I guess we'll take questions at the end. I have my contact information on the slide here as well. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Mike. That was an, that was excellent. Um, I want to encourage yeah. everyone to put any questions they have for Mike or any of our um, panelists or Brady, I guess, in the Q&A section. And we will be talking about them after, um, after Brady's presentation. So thank you again, Mike. And we'll move on then to uh, Brady Allred. He is a rangeland ecologist at the University of Montana. He works with the Natural Resources Conservation Service to spatially target and evaluate farm bill conservation programs. So working with an excellent team of scientists, he has led the development of the range and rangeland analysis platform, um, which I'm sure he'll tell you more about, an online tool that empowers landowners and research managers to track vegetation through time. So um, with that, I'll leave it to you, Brady. Thank you, Natalie, and thank you, Mike, for that wonderful presentation. Uh, it's fascinating to see all the all the wonderful technological advancements that everyone is doing. Um, you know, it's it's just fascinating to think that the things we were thinking about and dreaming about, you know, 40, 30, 20, 10, maybe even five years ago, are are now possible. Uh, and so I'm I'm excited to see where the where the future takes us. Um, today, I'm going to, to talk about the Rangeland Analysis Platform, or, or the RAP, as it's, as it's more commonly uh, known. Um, so let me get started here. So what is Rangeland Analysis Platform, or what is the RAP? Uh, the Rangeland Analysis Platform is actually two things. Um, the, the first thing that it is, it's, it's a set of, of data, or a group of data sets. 
And that's really the, the engine behind the rangeland analysis platform. Um, there's two primary, two primary uh, data sets that I'll be talking about today. Our rangeland cover data set, which measures uh, percent, um, percent cover of rangeland functional groups and our rangeland production data set. And I'll talk about those uh, in, a, in a moment. The, the second thing that the rangeland analysis platform is, is it's a, a web application. Uh, it's available there on your screen at that URL, rangelands.app.app. And if I have uh, the time at the end of this presentation, I'll give a brief demonstration of that web application. So the question, why the rangeland analysis platform? And, and Mike hit on it in, in his presentation. The, the rangeland discipline has a tremendous history. In fact, we are the leaders. We wrote the books on, on plant sampling. Uh, we do that really, really well. But the one thing that our rangeland monitoring does not do is it, these methods do not scale. Uh, there are not, there are not enough, there's not enough time. There's not enough people. Uh, and there's definitely not enough money to, to monitor the rangelands at the level we would like to monitor them at. And this is, this is a problem that the discipline has grappled with since its inception. And we've come up with various techniques to, to do our best and various sampling methods and sampling design and statistical analyses. Uh, but when it comes down to it, these methods simply do not scale. And so we can use uh, technology, specifically geospatial and remote sensing technology, to add to these methods. And I say add, I don't mean replace, but to add to these methods and to add value to what we do on the ground. And so that's, that's, what the, that's why the rangeland analysis platform uh, was developed. So the data sets. As I said, uh, we've produced a rangeland cover data set that measures uh, percent a cover for rangeland functional groups. That is produced at an annual time step. Um, we've also produced a rangeland production data set, which measures forage, uh, measured in, in units of pounds per acre, the common uh, currency of rangeland production. And that is also available at an annual time step and at a 16 days time step uh, throughout the year. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about our vegetation cover data set. I'm not gonna get into the nitty gritty details. Uh, I can later on if, if, if you'd like, uh, but we were able to produce uh, maps of rangeland cover. And this is continuous cover. When I say continuous, uh, meaning from zero to 100%, a continuous measure of rangeland cover for the entire Western uh, United States. Uh, so for a, for a large geography. And we do this for five different functional groups, perennial forbs and grasses, annual forbs and grasses, shrubs, trees, and bare ground. And as I said, we, we provide this data set at an annual time step, meaning it is available from 1984 to the present, uh, present day. In fact, I, we just ran 2020 uh, data uh, last week and it is now, now available. These data sets um, are available at a, a medium to fine spatial resolution of 30 meters. And to put 30 meters in context, it's about the size of a baseball diamond, uh, more or less. And so if you're wondering how many baseball diamonds are across the entire Western United States, uh, it's a lot. It's somewhere between five and a half and six billion. Uh, and so there's a, there's a lot of land out there. And for each one of those uh, baseball diamonds or each one of those pixels, we provide an estimate of vegetation cover. Now, a lot of people ask, how, how, did, how did we make this? Uh, this is my one method slide for this data set. Uh, and I've, I've kept it very simple and I'm not gonna get into the nitty gritty details. And so the first thing to recognize is that the, this data set in particular is based off of on the ground data, data that was collected by um, uh, or through the NRCS NRI program and the BLM AIM program. And we used about 60,000 on the ground plots that measure rangeland cover, uh, vegetation cover. And these have been collected since 2004 across, uh, across the entire Western United States. So a good number of plots. Now, when you combine, you, now what we did is we combine that on the ground data with the satellite uh, data that's been available for, the, for a long time. 
Um, the Landsat missions that many of you may be, may be familiar with, uh, the first one was, was launched in, uh, in the early 70s. But really starting in the early 80s, 1984, uh, with Landsat 5, the Landsat missions really took off. And we've had Landsat satellites up orbiting the Earth um, every 16 days since 1984. And in some cases, um, we've had two sensors up, uh, like we do now, where we have two satellites uh, orbiting the Earth. And that has provided a wealth of information for natural resource management, not just for rangeland management, but just natural resource management uh, in general. And so the other thing that's changed uh, through the years is the computational power has increased, uh, specifically the rise of cloud computing. With, with cloud computing, we are able to throw massive amounts of, of computation at these satellite images and at these plot data that we just couldn't do before. And so what we did is we combined the on the ground plot data with the satellite imagery and using cloud computing and some artificial intelligence uh, modeling, machine learning modeling, specifically neural networks. We we're able to produce maps across this wide geography from the Great Plains to the Pacific Coast and through time from 1984 to present of, of our rangeland vegetation covered data set. And I'll demonstrate that uh, in the web app here shortly. Um, our second data set is, is what is our rangeland production data set or what we call our biomass data set online. And that's a, me uh, a measurement of herbaceous biomass measured in pounds per acre. And similar to the, the cover data set, we separate that out into two different categories, perennial forbs and grasses and annual forbs and grasses. And we also combine the two so you can look at herbaceous uh, total. But what this gives is this gives an annual estimate of above ground herbaceous biomass from 1986 to present. And we also provide a 16 day estimate. So for any given year, you can look at the, the change in rangeland production uh, within any given year and see how things, how production is increasing, how pr production is decreasing and see the change that's happening within a year on that 16 day time step. And similar to the vegetation covered data set, these data, set, the data sets are available at, at a 30 meter resolution, about that, the size of a baseball diamond. Um, this data set uh, in particular was made as a little bit differently than the, uh, the, the rangeland covered data set. And we actually use a very long standing, long used uh, model called a light use efficiency model that actually measures the amount of growth that is occurring on the ground. Uh, it measures the amount of sunlight that is being used by the plant and models that into production. And it does that for actually every day of the year, and we just divide it up into 16-day time steps. The other thing is we, we modified this algorithm quite a bit, and we were able to partition that production so we can look at how perennials are doing relative to annuals. And depending on what part of the geography you live in, that can be, that can be very important. Um, lastly, before I, I kind of demonstrate the web application, uh, I just want to kind of end here with this last slide of some guiding principles of, of using maps and using remotely sensed data. Um, many, many times people uh, think or want uh, remotely sensed data to replace on the ground data. And I'm, I'm here to say that that is not the case and, and should never be the case. Uh, really, these data sets should be used together and should be used with other local information, whether it's local data or local experience or other management frameworks. Remotely sensed data and, and satellite derived maps are they're just another tool in the toolbox for rangeland management and rangeland monitoring. And they should be used along all the other tools uh, that we use. And in particular, they need to be used in a decision-making framework. A lot of time people think maps are just gonna solve the problem, but, but uh, we have to remind people that maps don't solve the problem. Maps just provide us information that help us make a decision. And there's some other important uh, key notes there that I'd like to point out. Maps provide us the opportunity to look at the landscape, uh, you know, look across space, but also through time and get a better idea of that landscape variability. Maps aren't perfect. Uh, on the ground data isn't perfect. As, as Mike pointed out, none of our data collections are perfect. And so it's important to keep error in perspective and use maps when they're helpful. Uh, if they're not helpful, by all means, don't use them. And then also think critically about contradictions. Maps will oftentimes contradict what we think we know about a landscape, uh, a landscape 
or they may contradict other, other data sets, or they may contradict other maps uh, for that matter. Sometimes those contradictions are the map's fault. Sometimes those contradictions are our own personal biases and our knowledge of a landscape isn't as complete as, as we might think it is. And so it's important to think critically about contradictions uh, when they occur. So lastly, and I have about uh, 10 minutes or so, I'm gonna give a very brief kind of overview of, of the application. And so you guys can see uh, what it's like. It's a publicly available uh, web application available at rangelands.app. And so anyone can go there, you can go there right now. Uh, and this is what kind of pulls up. We have a landing page, which uh, provides information. I, I encourage you to, to check it out. Uh, specifically, we just launched a new support page. And so if you click on the support page, it will take you to a, a different uh, site that you can come back to uh, that has articles, videos, demonstrations of how these data can be used and how to use the web application. So please, please check that out. We just launched that this week. Um, and so I'm actually just gonna jump straight into the web application here uh, real quick and kind of just give a, 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 crash, a, a crash test, a, a dive into this to see what it's like. Um, the, the rangeland analysis platform is just built on a simple Google Maps uh, type interface. And so it's, it's very easy to use. Uh, my children are experts at using uh, Google Maps. And so what we have here on the right is kind of the map uh, version of it, uh, the map panel where we visualize these data sets. These data sets are very large because they cover large geographies and a large time period. And so we wanted to make, the reason we made this application was to be able to, to easily visualize and allow people to interact with these data sets without downloading literally terabytes uh, worth of data. And so on the right, we have, we have the map visualization. And on the left, left we kind of have the, the data panel uh, where you can control, control what you're looking at. You can kind of toggle on the satellite layer with Google Maps, toggle that uh, on and off um, as you would any Google Maps uh, type interface. What we're looking at right now is the perennial forb and grass layer uh, for 2019. Uh, 2020 will be updated uh, very, very, very soon. But you can turn that off and you can also look at our biomass layer. And what we're seeing now is the herbaceous uh, or the, the combination of perennials and annuals uh, for 2019. And I'm gonna darken that a little bit so we can see kind of a, a better picture. And so you can change the specific year. Like I said, we can go back to you know, early 2000s and we, we can see how things uh, look, you know, 20 years ago, you can zoom in uh, to an area to an area that a project that you're working on or an area that, that you actively manage and see that visual representation. Uh, one of the things we wanted to be able to do with this uh, platform is to provide the ability to do simple analyses, because although maps are great and they allow us to visualize things through space and time, uh, being able to summarize that data is even more important because that's what can help us make decisions. And so we have the ability where you can upload a shape file or a polygon, or you can draw a polygon and you can do a simple analysis. And so I'll demonstrate that um, right now. And I'm just gonna show a BLM grazing allotment in kind of central uh, Montana, the, the, B, the Billings uh, field office uh, in particular. I'm going to turn the cover data set back on just so you can see better the outline. And so it will load that polygon or that shape file. And what you can do is you can click on it and you can calculate uh, the time series. And what'll, what, what this will do is it'll go out and talk to our servers in Silicon Valley and calculate the average for this polygon uh, for each year. And so on the right, we have what we call the analysis panel. And what we're looking at right now is a time series of cover for this particular grazing allotment. A little small, so I'm going to make it bigger here and blow it up. And so what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn off uh, a few of these things. I'm just going to look at perennial forb and grass cover and bare ground cover for this particular allotment. And so what this provides us is, is this time series from 1984 to present uh, or 1984 to 2020 last year of annual cover. And you can see that, you know, in the early 80s, uh, this particular allotment maybe had a little bit reduced cover than what it is now. But for the most part, part, it's been mostly stable. 
Uh, bare ground, on the other hand, has gone down uh, through time. And I don't know the specific management practices with this allotment, so I can't comment on the management, but there has been some favorable uh, precipitation uh, through the years, which may have, uh, may have helped uh, with that. And so you can look at the different functional groups uh, and see, see this data, see this particular time series. You can do the same thing for annual biomass. Uh, and so what we're looking at here is a comment as the annual biomass estimates for annuals, perennials, and then annuals, perennials, and combined for herbaceous. And so I'm just going to turn that one on. And so this particular one, uh, we can look at and, and say, you know, through time, the production on this allotment has been, has been increasing. In the 80s, in the early 80s, or, you know, early 90s, it was between 500 to 800 pounds per acre. And now it's, it's producing on the orders of, the, you know, a thousand pounds uh, per acre. And there's annual variability, as you would expect, due to, you know, weather and climate uh, and, and other things. Again, I don't know the management behind this uh, specific allotment, so I can't comment on, on any uh, management changes that, that were made. Lastly, uh, I'll highlight our 16-day biomass uh, data set. This provides 16-day biomass for uh, any given year, including the year that we're in now. And so it shows 20, uh, 2021 kind of uh, a near real-time estimate. Our last estimate was about 16 days ago in March 5th, and we're about ready to run. Uh, literally today, we will run our newest estimate uh, for the new 16-day time period. But you can go back and you can look, you know, say 2020, and you can look at what is that growth curve for 2020, and how did that production change during the year? And again, this is separated in between, you know, uh, annual forbin grass biomass, perennial forbin grass biomass, and then the combination of uh, herbaceous biomass. And so you can see that uh, for any particular year that you're interested in, uh, whether it's a dry year or a wet year, you can go and see what are those, you know, intro seasonal uh, dynamics. Uh, the last thing I'll demonstrate uh, um, before I sign off here is we wanted to be able to make these data available so you can use them in reports, you can use them in your own analyses. And so if you are interested in uh, downloading the data that go into these graphs, uh, you can just click here on these buttons here, download them as a CSV file or as an Excel file. I'll just go ahead and uh, download the Excel file. Uh, and just to give you a demonstration, and then you can open that up. And for this particular polygon uh, that we were looking at, it will give, um, in particular, the 16-day biomass is the one I downloaded. And so you can get this data for uh, the, entire, the entire time series, and you can use it in your own charts or in your own reports or any of your own uh, analyses that you may be interested in. Lastly, and uh, I'll... I'll put my um, email address in, in the chat box when I'm done. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me directly and I'm, I'm happy to help you kind of walk, uh, walk you through this and kind of answer any questions uh, that you may have. Oh, and one thing I also forgot is we also, you can download these data, uh, the, the images themselves, uh, the actual data themselves and uh, the links are available on, on the, the website. So if you have any questions, uh, I'd be happy to answer them. These have been really great um, presentations. And so we do have some questions in the box. So I'm gonna start with some questions for um, Mike. So Brady has a little break. Um, so Mike, do you fly well plans individually or have the drone fly multiple pads in the area? For instance, can they scan multiple pads in one flight or is it just analyzing one at a time when you're thinking about planning these flights? Yeah, that really depends on, on sort of what field you're operating in. Um, some of the preliminary work has been done up in the Jonah Fields in Wyoming, which is up 2,900 well pads and they're in pretty close proximity. So it may actually work to fly multiple well pads just on one, one go. Um, in other parts of the world, the well pads are a lot less dense, and so you probably want to do one at a time. So far, the preliminary work we've done, you know, we've just been doing one well pad at a time. Um, so that worked. Great. Um, okay, and so and a couple more questions about kind of using these processes. 
do you think it would be feasible to utilize publicly available satellite data for right of way monitoring at a field wild scale? So could all could someone go in and and um, look at all the right of ways within North Dakota mapped at field wide set with like satellite imagery? Do you think that there's enough? And and how often do those satellites actually pass over? Do you think? Well, I, you know. Brady, I think jump in here, but you know it's definitely it's definitely possible to do monitoring. It really depends on what the question you're asking um, is. I think Brady's presentation showed there's definitely some questions that you can ask, and you be, can begin to understand that. Um, other questions you may you may not be able to answer. You know, like the invasive species, you're not going to be able to necessarily see that as extensively on satellite imagery just because of resolution requirements. But as Brady's shown, there's lots of questions that you can answer using that type of data um, at that scale as well. Yeah, and Brady, do you have something to chime in on that? No, yeah, I think Mike hit it on the head. It, it really comes down to the question uh, that you're asking and using the, the best tool uh, available for that. So if you're, if you're really interested in very local site-specific uh, management, um, then you, you need to use those tools that help you do that. And, you know, from a technology perspective, that could be, that could be drones and that could be combining it with on-the-ground on the ground data. If you're interested in, in a more broader scale management or going Going back in time or continuity through time, you might use you might use a different tool, and so it, it's fitting the, the right tool uh, with the right question. So, just as a follow up for for you guys, um, what do, if if someone was considering what the best technology for the imagery would be, whether it was a drone, investing in, in analyzing with a drone versus what's available in satellite imagery? Um, what are some key ways that people can kind of move through that decision tree. Um, do you have some pointers for that? If people are considering what the best tool is? I guess I'll, you want me to start, Mike? <laughs> yeah, go, go for it. Um, you know, I, I think it comes down to just, there's, there's a lot that goes into it. I mean, there's, our, our goal with the rangeland analysis platform was to produce an off the shelf product that can be used for a wide variety of things, whether it's monitoring, reclamation, um, and across the course of wide geography. And, and so that is probably the, the, the initial path of least resistance, right? It's something that's already made uh, and that you don't have to go and make something yourself. But again, that won't work for every single use case. Uh, if it, won't work, it won't work for every single question. And so I kind of view it as a gradient where you start there and if that doesn't work, then you have to explore, you know, different tools and different technologies. But then it, it you know, it may be working with someone like Mike and his company to develop a product specific for, for your project that will work really well that's just not available um, off the shelf. And, and doing that requires, you know, expertise, whether that's through a company or in-house, uh, you have to be able to, to do that and, and manipulate all these satellite images or drone images and, and take all the steps necessary to do it. So it's kind of a, a gradient from, you know, off the shelf to, to more complex and more specific. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I mean, there's sort of... Um like a Swiss army knife of different data sources available. And then the same thing when you look at how you analyze that data and, and sort of interrogate it and understanding the assumptions around that. Uh, we looked at uh, Landsat as well as Sentinel-2 imagery today, which are two of the publicly available resources, but there's also, you know, all kinds of privately available satellites. Um, I follow this guy on LinkedIn that's a space reporter, which is an interesting job title, but he's continuously reporting on launches of private satellites. Um, and it's, it's really just staggering how many satellites are in orbit capturing Earth observation data all the time. A lot of them you have to pay for, um, but you know there's just a ton of different options out there. So you've got to formulate the right question and then you can kind of dig down and see, see what you can answer with what's out there. Great. Okay, so um, to go back to the question and a, the question and answer session, 
How quickly could a specific anomaly be identified with today's current technological abilities? So could an anomaly, so people, you know, for instance, a spill or, or something else, could it be identified within hours, a day, and could identification of these potential anomalies be utilized to maximize effectiveness of field inspection or survey? So I, could you identify them and could they be used to feedback and um, improve our detection of anomalies? And maybe Harold can give us an example of an anomaly um, that would help guide that answer. Yeah, I mean, I, I think again, an, an example of sort of what you're thinking would be really useful because, um, you know, the advantage of, of a drone, you know, is that it's basically an on-demand platform. So if you have a drone, it can come in a box that's this big and you can drive out to your site uh, and, and pull it out, you know, set it up on the tailgate of your truck, take off, and you can have some form of data to look at just a few minutes later. Um, but you're only going to be able to capture maybe a few few hundred acres at a time um, with most systems that are out there. So spills, yeah. So you may be able to document something like that. Um, you know, and then the quality of data is another thing because there's different methods for sort of post-processing drone data. You, like the invasive species map that we looked at in England, we took more than a thousand images and processed that into a cohesive worth of mosaic map. At the same time, there's a lot of utility in just having a drone and being able to take a, a geospatially tagged photo of a location. Um, then on the other end, you know, you've got you've got satellite imagery data, which can be um, at different intervals. It could be, you know. There's some, some platforms on the private side that advertise daily capture. You're gonna have to pay for that, uh, but it's gonna be a lower resolution than the drone. So this is sort of that decision tree that you were alluding to earlier is how, how often, what quality do you need? What's the spatial resolution? Do you need to incorporate spectral characteristics as part of that as well? Kind of teasing those things about it. That day. Yeah, if you're looking for, for that day, just seeing Harold added a little information in the Q&A, um, usually the most effective means would be a, a drone for, depends on, I guess, the area you're looking at. But it's really hard to turn around satellite imagery. I don't know of any way to do that within um, like a same day kind of, of method. Yeah. I think um, there, there was a question about whether changes in surface vegetation, standing liquid and significant changes of surface moisture be identified. So it sounds like it's plausible, but not in the same day sort of thing, unless you're there with a drone and that day you're probably, it's, it's unlikely to be that immediate or to, to notify in, within a daily time period of a spill alert or something like that. Is that is that what you're saying? Yeah, I think you, you'd have a hard time um, doing that. There's certain you know, emergency response situations where they can fly a satellite over, and I'm talking about you know, like hurricane response or something like that, um, where some of these, some of the private companies might be able to fly over a site and have the data downloaded, maybe just a few hours later. Um, usually that's for like, the, the circumstances where I've seen that have not been on my projects. They've been for like the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. Um, so above my pay grade officially, I'm getting that <laughs> type of service. Great. Um, so Brady, do you have any tutorials on using your Rangeland app in a classroom? Uh, they are coming. And so I, I highlighted that new support site and on there we will be, we are specifically developing and, and we'll put on there kind of a, a curriculum on using the rangeland analysis platform uh, in, a, in a classroom, in a lab setting. And it's something we will have modules and lab exercises that uh, teachers, professors, they can use uh, to help teach this with their students. Great. So looks like we've answered most of the questions in the 
Q&A box um, and Brady and Mike have provided their information. So I'm sure they're willing to follow up with you. Um, if you've got further questions, I would like to ask the, our, our, com, our panelists each, if they could give us a brief um, kind of final thoughts, take home message for all our uh, listeners in the internets. Um, that you would like them to take away for their practices today. We can start with, with Mike. Sure, yeah, so um, Brady, it was fascinating seeing your research as well. So thank you very much for sharing that. If I had one takeaway, it sort of alludes to one of the thoughts that actually Brady brought up, which is um, I have one of our clients had this quote, and I wrote it down, I say it all the time. We're making maps that we've never been able to make before. Um, and it, it almost, you know, gives me goosebumps when I talk about it because my job uh, that I do right now didn't really exist even just five or 10 years ago. And now, you know, there's this demands and the ability to, uh, to service people with the services we provide. So really exciting, exciting time. And, and it's um, changing very fast. Yeah, Mike hit it on the head again. Uh, it, it's very exciting. And I guess I would just encourage people to think how, how can we use this type of information in our, in our workflows, in our frameworks, our decision-making frameworks, and, you know, where do, where do they fit in and, and where they, where do they not fit in? That's, those are the questions we need to be asking is how do we, how do we learn to use these types of data? Uh, and once we start asking those questions, uh, these data will be incredibly useful and uh, there'll be a lot of, a, a large return on investment. Great. So thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to remind everyone that all of the uh, presentations are recorded and they will be available at ndreclamation.com. Um, thank you very much for joining us. Next week is our reclamation to achieve the most bang for your buck. So follow up there. I want to again, thank our panelists for this very um, interesting webinar. And as I said, their, their contact information is available. So please feel free to follow up with them. That sounds like they're willing to listen and to provide you some feedback. So thank you again, and I hope you all have a fantastic day. Mm -hmm.